Dr. Smriti Gardia from the Medical Team of USV. It is a pleasure to welcome all the delegates to the EAC ENCO National Webinar. In August 2023, European Society of Cardiology took place in Amsterdam, Netherlands. ESC Congress has covered topics across the whole of cardiovascular medicine by presenting and discussing the latest scientific findings and the providing in-depth clinical teaching and practice changing education. ESC has also released four separate clinical guidelines addressing the management of acute coronary syndrome, cardiomyopathies, diabetes and endocarditis, and a focused update of ESC heart failure, which was released this year. So the aim of this meeting is to share the key perspective from the ESC Congress 2023 and to discuss these guidelines clinical significance. So for fulfilling today's aim of discussion, we have with us three eminent speaker and one renowned moderator uh, with us. Thank you all for being with us here today, sir. So our moderator for today's event is Dr. P.P. Mohan, sir. Sir is the director and HOD cardiology of Westford High Tech Hospital. Sir is the past president of Cardiological Society of India. Sir has published the largest acute coronary syndrome registry from India and has done the largest randomized study in cardiovascular science from India. He was the first, he did the first quality improvement study in chronic HF. Our first speaker for today's event is Dr. Kamal Sharma, sir. Sir is a senior interventional cardiologist with vast experience of coronary angioplasty, stenting, valvuloplasty, pacemakers, and pediatric interventions. He has done the world's first vagal nerve stimulation device plan as part of Anthem study in refractory heart failure. He has discovered winking coronary sign of VSR on angiography and which is now also called Kamal Sharma sign of VSR. Sir has 205 publications and more 85 Google Scholar citations. Our second speaker for this event is Dr. J.C. Mohan, sir. Sir is the chairman of, of the Institute of Heart and Vascular Disorders, Jaipur Golden Hospital, New Delhi. Sir has over 370 index publications, three books and 87 chapters. Sir is the past president of the Indian Academy of Echocardiography and Cardiological Society of India. Sir has also re received Lifetime Achievement Award by Cardiological Society of India uh, in 2021. Our third speaker for today is Dr. Prakash Kumar Hazra, sir. Sir is the head of the Department of Cardiology, Director of Cardiac Cath Lab, AMRI Hospital, Kolkata. Sir has more than 200 given uh, lectures, uh, seminar symposium on SGLT2 inhibitors. He was the first to be associated with prostate artery embolism in Eastern India. Sir has been associated with innovative technology with TAVI, laser and RF ablation of varicose veins, cerebral thrombectomy, carotid angioplasty, and aortic aneurysm. I welcome you all, sir. And now I would like to hand over the session on, sir, for the context setting. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Shruti. Uh, thank you, uh, USV. So, as Shruti was mentioning, we have three erudite speakers to talk uh, uh, very important sessions um, from the recently held ESC. Uh, we have Kamal Sharma talking about the risk stratification in diabetic settings. And also he will be touching on um, the possible role of SGLT2 inhibitors uh, in setting up acute myocardial infarction, where there is still, a, uh, uh, we don't have any definite uh, data or uh, uh, guidelines. Then we have Professor Jesse Mohan uh, talking about two important issues where again, we are, uh, uh, a little bit confused, the, the important role of salt in heart failure and also uh, exercise in heart failure. Two areas which are absolutely relevant, but we have some confusions around. And finally, we have uh, Prakash Hasra talking about uh, the usefulness of SGLT2 inhibitors in specific settings like uh, 
very elderly heart failure patients or is there any geographical differences in the efficacy of SGLT2 inhibitors? And one focused attention to when the right ventricle becomes the systemic ventricle. Very rare situation. But then let us all listen to these very important uh, um, topics and the erudite speakers. And I will request all my listeners to chip in with their uh, the questions in the chat box. Uh, I can see Kamal live. And so we will not alter the program, Professor Mohan. We will start with uh, uh, Kamal Sharma. And uh, uh, over to you, Kamal. Thank you very much for kind words, uh, respected seniors, Dr. Mohan and Dr. J.C. Mohan and Dr. Hajra. I'm at least a decade old, uh, younger in uh, chronological age, but surely uh, you guys are more senior and more expertized and more learned than me at least a decade more than I am. So uh, very high regards to all three of you. And with such a senior and elite panel, I'm going to take you through a couple of slide deck, uh, which is important in terms of the ESC guideline and heart failure. And I'll touch upon the ESC guidelines, how they have refocused and actually re-emphasized need for SGLT2. I think as I always believe and I feel that cardiology and diabetology was something that was always so nitty-grittily uh, integrated with each other. It was just us who actually tried to separate the two into subspecialities. And now SGLT2s have got it back, interwoven into a practice where you cannot distinguish between these two non-communicable disorders. So the latest uplist from the EAC Congress for the way forward for CBD and diabetes is what I'm going to touch upon. Next slide, please. So I'll touch in this session about the ESC guideline of assessing cardiovascular risk in type 2 diabetes. There is a new score, the score score, as they say, uh, which has come with its second generation. That's what I will touch. Glycemic targets, ASCVD revised a new recommendation, hypertension screening diagnosis in diabetics, so also CKD and some new studies where the impact of A1C on cardiovascular disease with and without CAD and SGLT2 for secondary prevention EMI in patients uh, who present with diabetes mellitus. Can I have the next slide, please? So the guidelines for the management of cardiovascular disease in diabetes was touched upon by the task force that was specifically looking for this subgroup. So that's what ESC thought of refocusing to include diabeto and cardiologists together into a task force and come out with a separate guideline. So this is what I'm going to touch upon. Next slide, please. So basically what they are emphasizing is to define severe target organ damage. Now, when you assess CV disease in a diabetic patient, it should be not only the medical and family history, but also look at symptoms finding from the exam, lab test, and some diagnostic tests with or without presence of CVA, CVD, or target organ damage, where target organ damage means, and they've re-emphasized this very strongly, is loss of protein from kidney. We know this, how micro and macro albuminuria is a surrogate marker of TOD, but it's been re-emphasized here. If your patient has a EGFR, which is below 45, whether or not he has albuminuria, he is at severe TOD. Or if your EGFR is between 45 to 59 and microalbuminuria is present, or if there is a gross proteinuria or presence of microvascular disease in at least three different sites, with, then this will be called as stage A2, which is plus retinopathy, plus neuropathy. So this is the definition. If your EGFR is less than 45, you have 45 to 60 with microalbuminuria or proteinuria, which is gross, USCR more than 300, which is stage A3, or presence of multivascular organ involvement, at least three different sites, plus a retino and neuropathy. Next slide. So once you have defined very high-risk patient category is now called as presence of diabetes with established ASCVD. So even if you, which is a face post-CABG, post-stroke, post-angioplasty, post-AMI, uh, or a patient who's got severe target organ damage, or if your 10-year risk of risk score to diabetes that is now reframed as more than 20%. High risk is somebody whose score is between 10 to 20% using the score to diabetes score and patient is diabetes but not fulfilling very high risk. Moderate risk is patient of diabetes not fulfilling very high risk and the score is between 5 to 10% and in those whose score is less than 5% and have diabetes not fulfilling any of those above criteria will be categorized as low CV risk. So now you have just like we had ACVD scores 
uh, which we used to use. Now we have a score two diabetes score where you can categorize their severity for cardiovascular risk ranging from 5% to more than 20%. Next slide, please. So th they have looked at an example here as a case. Uh, basically, in patients who are more than 40 years of age, uh, again, is common here. That's the way we do for ASCVD in diabetes. Without ASCVD, it is recommended and you calculate 10-year CV risk. So this is an example here. You have a 48-year-old female diagnosed with uh, at the age of 35 years as the following profile. Um, systolic blood pressure 138, total cholesterol 6.4 millimoles, HDL of 3.1, A1C of 92, uh, which is like 10.6%, and EGFR, which is normal of 115. So once you click that, and then the app will give you, you enter into the app, it's also available online. You can click on which score you're looking at, score two or score two diabetes, click on them, and then try to put all the data that are available. And then you go next, and then this data gets updated. Next slide, and it'll give you a risk score so that score two diabetes score next slide please would be calculated like this so once you keep on putting up the personal history the personal risk factors we put on the values of blood pressure cholesterol and the a1c and the lipid profile you'll get the risk score for this patient for this patient it is coming to less than five percent so 10 year risk is 4.6 percent next slide now, why do you want to do all this because you want to decide what therapy the patient will end up with so basically, in patients with ASCVD and severe TOD, you do scoring and you calculate the score. If it's more than 20%, it's very high risk, 10 to 20, high, 5 to 10, moderate, less than 5, low risk. So in diabetic patients without symptomatic ASCVD or TOD, it is recommended to estimate this, and they now call it as a class 1B risk score, a uh, uh, level of evidence for recommendation of assessment in diabetics. So every practically diabetic patient which, who has got the ASCVD, CVD or an expected TOD, you must define how bad or high, high risk CV risk the patient is carrying. Next slide. You need to be looking at to guide the glycemic targets. You will have to look at two aspects. One, is the patient's life expectancy short or if it's a longer life expectancy? If you have a less life expectancy, a short life expectancy because of expected disorders, say malignancy or any terminal illness, then the uh, glycemic targets can be relaxed to be kept below 8.5. Don't go too aggressive because hypoglycemias are what you entail once you go very aggressive and then the hypoglycemia itself can trigger an event. Otherwise, targets are pretty clear to keep it below 7 and give priority to CV protective low hypoglycemic agents which are focused on DPP-4, SGLT-2, metformin and uh, other novel agents which are less prone to hypoglycemia. Next slide. So, it is recommended to apply tight glycemic control less than 7 as class 1A and also to avoid hypoglycemia as class 1B. Next slide. That's pretty clear for the glycemic targets. And uh, SGLT2, because of this proven CV benefit, uh, have, are recommended in type 2 diabetes ASCV to reduce CV events independent of baseline and target A1C and independent of glucose lowering as class 1A. This is also true for GLP-1 analogs now because of the strong data that has emerged for semaglutide. There were a couple of papers on injectable semaglutides on obesity, a release date ESC, uh, which I'm not touching upon. But GLP-1 analogs have proven CV benefit is recommended in type 2 diabetes ASCVD. And we know trials like Sustain 6 and Beyond Pioneer 6, which have shown that they are also CV protective and they should be have been recommended as class 1A indication. Next slide. So glucose lowering treatment uh, should be focusing primarily to reduce CV risk based on the ASCVD. So when a patient who's got moderate risk, risk assessment for patients with type diabetes based on presence of ASCVD should also look at 10, uh, 10 years CVD risk assessment by score 2. And SGLT2 and GLP-1, as you can see, in very high risk, they will be present like a very strong recommendation. In the high risk but not so strong, metformin can also find a place. Uh, and otherwise, in low risk, you can continue with metformin, though SGLT2 can be used in, in, uh, in patients who've got other indications like heart failure or kidney disease. Next slide. So CV risk categorization in type 2 diabetes, as is based on ASCVD, TOD, and score 2 diabetes, 
uh, you also need to be chasing the LDLs by the categories. And very high risk patients should get an LDL level below 55 now by the ASC 23 recommendation as a class one indication. So now we have 55 being adopted in patients beyond ASCVD. We have patients with severe TOD or even score two diabetes, which is high risk without ASCVD would also be targeted for an LDL less than 55. High risk patients, you can target 70. Moderate risk, you can target 100. All three are class one recommendations. Next slide. Again, absolute benefits and harm with SGLT2 uh, with diabetes are pretty much known, but they are reinforced here. With high atherosclerotic cardiovascular risk with EGFR mean of 80. Uh, events that are avoided or caused over 1,000 patients, you can see that you reduce two event rates for kidney disease progression, five for cardiovascular death and hospitalization, ketoacidosis, limb amputations are in decimals, uh, and you also actually are preventing one acute kidney injury when you choose, uh, choose 1,000 patient years in SGLT2 groups. So definite cardiovascular benefits outweigh in diabetic patients very strongly. Next slide. Blood pressure and diabetes. Now they are talking about high normal, systolic 130 to, uh, 130 to 139, diastolic 85 to 89, where you can do out-of-office BP measurement. And hypertension patients are defined as 140-90, T, where you need to check BP uh, out of office or as well as at home or office BP measurements. ABP, MHBM have been emphasized in this subgroup of patients. So these are, again, coming very strongly. Anti-hypertensive recommended if the blood pressure are more than 140-80. And regular BP checkup is very important in diabetics to detect and treat it uh, to reduce CV risk in these group of, group of patients. Um, uh, and on treatment, BP target below 130 may be considered in diabetics, particularly with those with CV events. To further reduce event is class 2B. And home BP monitoring should be considered in diabetes and anti-hypertensive treatment to check um, at appropriately control as 2A. Next slide. So pharmacological treatments that are known to now reduce the kidney failure or cardiovascular risk in patients of type 2 diabetes CKD have also been touched upon. To reduce the same, they talk about statin-based regimes, and they also talk about ACE or ARV as class 1. But now to reduce cardiovascular and renal failure risk, we know that beyond SGLT2, uh, beyond statins and ACE or ARV, you have SGLT2, blood pressure control, and pinerinone also chipping in as class 1 agent now. So if you have a patient who's defined as diabetic kidney disease, you have a class 1 level recommendation for finrinone also apart from SGLT2. Of course, additional glucose tolerance, you have uh, glucose control, you have GLP-1 analogs, metformin, DPP-4, and insulin also getting good recommendations. Next slide. Can I have, yeah. So uh, CKD and diabetes is another subset in itself. Uh, you can see that uh, SGLT2 inhibitor uh, which is all CANA, EMPA, and DAPA is recommended in type 2 diabetes with EGFR more than 20 now. Previously, we had this 20-30 discrepancy for EMPA, DAPA. Now it's uniform. And finrinone is recommended in patients uh, in addition to ACRB in EGFR more than 60 and USCR more than 30 or EGFR between 25 to 60 and USCR more than 30 to reduce CV events is also class 1. GLP-1 analogs is recommended for EGFR more than 15 to achieve adequate glycemic control due to low risk of hypoglycemia and beneficial effects of weight loss and albuminuria. Next slide. So absolute Benefits and harms of SGLT2 with or without diabetes. If you look here uh, in diabetic subgroup, the events that are prevented by form of kidney disease progression is by 11, EGFR by 4, and no diabetes, it's 15. So it's nephroprotective across the spectrum and cardiovascular benefits you can see is 11 versus 2. So in diabetics, it does more than non-diabetics. Next slide. So the studies, I'll conclude to the last part, studies presented ESC, two important studies I'll touch upon. Next slide, which are on CV disease and diabetes. Next slide, please. So one was impact of glycemic hemoglobin, glycated hemoglobin on uh, a cardiovascular risk in patients with and without CAD. Next slide. Uh, there are a lot of been papers, including one of our own paper that we had published, how it's an important predictor, but this is much larger, more oriented and an uh, outcome-based study where they looked at MACE uh, and they looked at the hypothesis of an A1C higher being associated with higher CV risk. Next slide. 
This was contemporary cohort study, and they followed and a half years of follow-up of 15,000 plus patients, of which uh, 77 percent, 12,000 plus patients had CAD, 3,625 had no CAD, with a mean A1C of 6.9. Next slide, and they tried to look at the MACE rates. So significantly increase in MACE rates with A1C more than 7 percent for the entire cohort, and it plateaued. Uh, when the A1C was above 8.1. So this association was sustained in CAD as well as those without CAD. Now, but in those who uh, uh, had uh, no coronary artery disease, however, and the MACE rate did not plateau uh, for the A1C rise. So if you have CAD, it's all the more stringent and important to keep your A1Cs under check. If you don't have CAD, probably it's not so much hazardous as it is if you already have a CAD. So better the glycemic control in a CAD, better is the outcome for reduction in MACE. Next slide. So this is the conclusion. Less than seven is targeted to reduce the macrovascular complication in diabetics. Association between A1C and MACE is restricted to diabetes, while not so much is observed without those who have coronary artery disease. Next slide. This is for the SGLT2 for secondary prevention of AMI in patients with diabetes. Next slide. <clears throat> we know some of the data from MPULSE. So this is, again, they looked at to evaluate SGLT2 and clinical outcomes in MI uh, patients with diabetes. All uh, cause death and rehospitalization were looked at as the primary endpoint. So SGLT2 versus these uh, other glycemic lowering agents were studied, and they found out that the all-cause death or readmission for heart failure was significantly lower in those who are given SGLT2. This is a 5,000-plus patient study, nearly 5,000 patient study. Uh, all-cause death also was significantly reduced. So was heart failure hospitalization alone. Uh, recurrence of MI was not prevented. So these were two independent predictors. I'll continue. Next slide. And this is the composite of all death cause uh, rehospitalization and recurrent MI as the plot, uh, as the uh, 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 kaplan mayer curve. Next slide. So basically, new use of SGLT2 is associated with lower risk of all cause mortality hospitalization, whether they are uh, compared to those who are not given SGLT2 in MI with diabetes. So this is one more uh, frontier opened up uh, by SGLT for the SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, in patients uh, of uh, uh, acute MI with diabetes where you can start this therapy. Next slide. So thank you very much. And uh, over to Chair, Dr. Mohanan. Uh, thank you very much for having me as a speaker. Over to you. Thank you, Kamal, for that uh, excellent talk, touching on the, yeah, on the newer uh, data which we have seen in the uh, 2023 ESC. We will, we will definitely have a uh, uh, discussion. They are all very important. We have the pleasure of Professor J.C. Mohan. Next, over to you, sir. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mohan, and thank you, USB, for giving me this opportunity to interact with you and colleagues about uh, ESC guidance to cardiac disease in diabetes, exercise, diet, and salt. There is a pandemic of physical inactivity and unhealthy diet more so in this part of world that appear to parallel the widespread prevalence of cardiovascular disease and diabetes. The three major components of diet, salt, sugar, and fat affect three major risk factors, HbA1c, systolic blood pressure, and LDL cholesterol. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about ESC guidelines 2023 on lifestyle and diabetes, lifestyle risk factor components, recommendations, and also on new studies of exercise and cardiovascular disease, focusing more on active AF and PURE study, which had looked at a questionnaire-based physical activity. But before that, I have to make a preamble, and it is necessary for all of us to understand what has been the status of diet, exercise, and salt? So we know that the lifestyle risk factors are obesity, smoking, inactivity, nutrition-related stress, poor sleep, social isolation, and substance abuse. Factors which influence diet and exercise in mankind are demography, race, ethnicity, social and cultural values and beliefs, age, and gender. We know in the past, Heart healthy diets have been recommended, especially Mediterranean diet, DASH diet, and vegetarian eating patterns, which have been which have been largely 
एविडेंस बेस्ड 2021 AHA dietary guidance to improve cardiovascular health is a combination of these three kind of diets that is dash mediterranean and vegetarian diet it says maintain an energy balance which means expenditure and intake should be equal more fruits and vegetables more whole grain food more plant based proteins more legumes liquid plant oil rather than topical oil no processed food restrict salt avoid sugar and limit alcohol dash eating plan actually is similar it uh, says that they should be diet should be low in salt added sugar tropical oil alcohol and processed food high non starchy vegetables fruits whole grains and legumes and proteins are mostly plant based and some of course from fish and seafood lean poultry and meats mm -hmm. and one should have low fat or fat free dairy product now we have to understand that this is something on which there is a good amount of controversy mediterranean mediterranean diet does not talk about salt restriction or alcohol restriction while dash diet does talk about salt and alcohol restriction fat actually has been the most controversial point because saturated fat in diet have been shown to be associated with endothelial activation or endothelial dysfunction inflammation and oxidative stress on the other hand pure data presented in 2017 esc by colleagues of dr salim yusuf showed that higher is the saturated fat intake lower is the overall mortality a view point which still has not been accepted by most of the guidelines however when you look at the pure study presented in august 2017 you would uh, you would understand that the all cause mortality increases as the total calorie intake from carbohydrates exceeds 50% in a similar way the calorie from fat as the calorie from fat actually exceed 10% all cause mortality goes down and it goes down by as much as 20% this is strange this is interesting because this aspect is from an observational population based study cohort study which still has not found acceptance in guidelines this as far as salt is concerned the aha has continued and the esc has continued with the recommendation that the sodium intake should be less than 1.5 gram per day and sodium chloride intake should be less than 4 gram per day obviously 39% sodium chloride is sodium and this is the aha guideline the esc has slightly liberal view and the who also has slightly liberal view so the who and esc believe that less than 5 g a day of salt is what should be recommended to keep the blood pressure under control and prevent all cause mortality while acc and aha continue to harp on less than 4 g per day the it is much more important in indians as far as salt restriction concerned because we are salt sensitive and in salt sensitive hypertensive asians especially south indians uh, especially south asians like we people there would be much greater reduction in systolic blood pressure with the salt restriction but we also have to keep in mind that combining actually the salt restriction with diet with a particular diet especially that dash diet results in a significant reduction in systolic blood pressure as much as 9 mm of mercury in case the salt intake is 3 g or less and dash diet this is something like equal to one anti hypertensive drug there are data and this data is largely from slim yusuf's group showing that higher is the urinary 24 hour urinary sodium excretion higher is the all cause mortality so all cause mortality is inversely associated with 24 hour urinary sodium so i am sorry this that that is the, the what we uh, what i was trying to say was that if you excrete less sodium that means you are retaining more sodium and there is a high chance of all cause mortality lifestyle risk factors contribute above and beyond traditional risk factors like diabetes hypertension dyslipidemia and smoking and one could actually with tongue in cheek say you are what you eat 
WHO recommendation physical activity is 150 to 300 minutes of walk, which they define as moderate physical activity. A vigorous physical activity, which is recommended actually for all individuals, including diabetics and including those with cardiovascular diseases, 75 to 150 minutes of brisk walking, you could call it vigorous physical activity or most more often nowadays it is recommended that should be a combination of the two which should which should actually expand 750 mets of energy actually in a week why exercise so important we have we have recently published data a few months back from uk biobank saying that Vigorous physical ex exercise actually reduces all-cause mortality and reduces cardiovascular mortality. And the benefit starts at a level of even 15 minutes per week of vig vigorous physical e exercise. And it tapers off once it reaches 50 minutes per week. So two things come out of this UK, UK Biobank study that even 15 minutes of vigorous exercise per week is good enough to lower cardiovascular mortality and 50 minutes vigorous exercise per week is where the effect tends to taper off with above 50 minutes of vigorous physical activity. The benefit tends to be relatively small. The, the, the data also actually indicates that not only is the all-cause mortality which goes down, but also cardiovascular disease and cancer. But you would note carefully that 60 or more minutes actually is where the which is the maximum and beyond that there is tapering effect so is true for all cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality a very recent study published in jack actually last month says 2800 steps per day yield significant mortality and cardiovascular benefit in this study of 1 lakh 11000 individuals but it also suggests that 8000 steps a, uh, steps a day is the optimum physical activity. ESC recommendations, the ESC recommend that the ESC recommended the individual living with overweight obesity aim to reduce weight and increase physical exercise to improve metabolic control. It is recommended and Mediterranean or plant-based diet is recommended with a class one uh, recommendation. Recommendation for physical activity is same. That is at 10 minutes daily walking should be added to whatever activity any diabetic is doing but is recommended to adapt exercise intervention type to diabetes associated comorbidities also. And it actually suggests that you should perform resistance exercises also in addition to endurance exercise at least once a week. Nutrition has been one of the essential lifestyle approach in diabetic individuals. And the guidelines suggest that consumption of sugar, sugar sweetened soft drink and fruit juices should be limited. A high-protein diet having 30% protein, 40% carbohydrate, and 30% fat seems to be the, the right kind of diet in overweight, obese, diabetic individuals. And high-protein diet results in greater reduction cardiovascular risk factors like HbA1c, cholesterol, triglycerides, and blood pressure. The ESC 2023 guidelines on the, for patients with diabetes with or without cardiovascular disease recommend stopping of smoking, and of course, there's a class 1A recommendation and nicotine replacement therapy is a class 2A, B indication. The key points to be kept in mind is that all patients with diabetes and CKD should be offered standard advice on smoking. Patients with intermittent claudication should also take part in exercise training program, and patients should perform at least two or more sessions per week of endurance exercise or resistance exercise, and this is a new thing Interval endurance exercise training of more vigorous intensity has superior effects than moderate intensity continuous walking. What have been the studied pre studies presented at the ESC 2023? Effect of 12-week supervised exercise-based cardiac rehabilitation, resting and exercise blood pressure in males and females. This is a study in which bicycle, bicycle CPAT has been used in individuals and BP at rest and on exercise, maximum exercise has been measured. And this is, an, uh, this is a study in which there are three sessions of supervised aerobic and resistant exercise per week. What is the, uh, what is the data? This is a long table, but it shows that the, with 12 weeks of this kind of mixed exercise, the basal heart rate gets reduced 
in VO2 max gets increased, SBT maximum increases, but resting systolic blood pressure is unaffected. So this is the summary of that study showing that after 12 weeks of cardiac rehabilitation, both males and females had a comparable improvement in VO2 peak and increased workload capacity, workload. And of course, the, the increased systolic blood pressure max was found in male and female both, but there were no change at rest, systolic blood pressure at rest. So this is this is the conclusion of the study. What about the next study? That is the effect of exercise on impact on atrial fibrillation. And this is a study called atrial, the active atrial fibrillation study. This is a prospective randomized control study in patients with symptomatic paroxysmal or persistent atrial fibrillation referred for consideration of atrial fibrillation, atrial fibrillation ablation. They were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either aerobic exercise intervention or usual medical care for a period of six months and then a further six months follow-up. The, the exercise intervention delivered in a hybrid format of weekly supervised exercise session with prescribed home exercise up to 210 minutes per week. And primary endpoint were recurrent AF without rhythm con control strategies. And, and of course, the two groups were almost similar with regard to except certain differences, which one can see in persistent atrial fibrillation like left atrial volume. What did we find in this study? The, the study found that in patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, there is 58% reduction in episodes of atrial fibrillation after six months of cardiac rehabilitation. There was a trend towards reduction in atrial fibrillation in patients with persistent atrial fibrillation, but that did not reach statistical significance. What else was seen? There was a reduction in AF symptoms, and the symptoms were reduced both in paroxysmal AF and persistent AF, and the symptom persisted up to 12 months, showing legacy effect of cardiac rehabilitation. So in this, these findings support the need for early lifestyle modification among patients with atrial fibrillation before progression to permanent atrial fibrillation occurs. The last study is pure study, which is a continuation of the study, which we have already seen. And here, of course, in all high income, middle income and low income countries, the, the effect of physical activity has been studied. The physical activity has been defined as vigorous or moderate physical activity, recreational or non-recreational. The, the end result of this study is that there is reduction in mortality, and plus cardiovascular disease, regardless of the amount of activity you do. So in both moderate physical activity and vigorous physical activity, the benefits begin at very low levels of physical activity and continued with increasing physical activity. At each amount of physical activity, lowest risk was in those participating in vigorous physical activity. There were no harmful effects of vigorous physical activity, even at extremely high levels, and at, at higher recreational uh, vigorous physical activity, the benefit began to diminish. Now, these data are very similar to UK Biobank cohort study. And so, ladies and gentlemen, to summarize, good diet, low salt and exercise promote cardiovascular health. We already know it, but the ESC guidelines tend to re-emphasize on this point. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Mohan, for that excellent uh details and uh, we seem to be getting newer and newer information every day about the advantages of uh, of exercises i'm sure this will generate a lot of uh, questions i have the pleasure of asking professor prakash hasra to have his lecture hasra please thank you sir um, yeah so heart failure redefined not much in 2023 the informations the knowledge, the science, the wisdom we gathered in last six, seven years was refined here for betterment and for better efficacy and better adoptions in the majority of patients what we treat in day-to-day -day practice. Now, in the session outline, ESC guide in 2023, they have re-emphasized the management of cardiovascular disease in type 2 diabetes mellitus, glucose lowering treatment of patients with heart failure and type 2 diabetes mellitus, guidelines for heart failure related to SGD2 inhibitors 
especially focusing M rape and Hep rape. And new studies that uh, Institute 2 are much more beneficial in patients who are having uh, diabetes with heart failure. And DAPAS Sartral, for the first time in congenital heart disease, if you have RV failure, small trial, an efficacy of DAPAGIPLOGIN, according to geographic, ethnic variations, and uh, uses, pattern, the adoptions, and initiation, etc., all over the globe in patients with heart failure. There are risk factors. Uh, I did not elaborate on these. If you have ischemic heart disease, you have one pattern of heart failure, more mortality than non-ischemic heart failure, female, male, early onset, variable heart disease. You must exclude the stenotic lesions. Chronic kidney disease, alcohol, substance use, other confounding variables are very important in diagnosis in maintenance or in rehabilitating these patients with modern care, modern facilities, modern device, vaccination, and et cetera. So there is definitely an algorithm for all types of heart disease now. And this is getting better and better every day. So lacuna or caveats or the things which we missed initially has been redefined, re-evaluated, and sometimes I feel it is the same wine in a new bottle. But there are a little bit of new information which I'll tell you during the discussion. So why ProBNP125? Uh, if you have it, a heart failure, whether ProBNP, diagnosis of heart failure, whether ProBNP is 120, is very unlikely that it is heart failure. Though there are some reports that people still can have, have heart failure with a normal ProBNP, the but these are not the main stream of heart failure, main varieties of heart failure, main uh, statistically significant number in the community. So 124, very unlikely, 125 and above, very likely. So if you have a doubt, you repeat the evolutions, repeat sampling after some time, and it has been classified in two groups. There are two types of heart failure now, either reduced or non-reduced. In non-reduced, you have MREP and hep -rep. Now, there was a lot of discussion in ADA 2023 about the usage of GLP-1. So GLP-1 class 2A, especially in obese diabetic, obese diabetic heart failure, if you can reduce your weight by a combination of three GLP agonists like GLP, GIP, and glucagon agonist and reduce your weight by 25 to 30 percent you get one type of benefit 35 to 40 percent another type of additional benefit that means you can have a remission of diabetes can reduce the blood pressure requirement of antihypertensive drugs the need for additional uh, anti-diabetic drugs and you have a better heart failure outcome the same thing can be achieved with the oral form. So there will be more and more data on uh, this kind of uh, molecule. The STEP trial is the first such kind of trial. Cetagliptin, Lilagliptin, class 2A. And in the same thing, in the same algorithm, they have mentioned that pioglitazone, class 3, this is not new, and saxagliptin, the stigma they have got in the previous trial, still they cannot come out from that stigma. And there, is, there are class 1A recommendations, 1B recommendations. I'm not going into the detail. Everybody knows this. So what's new? The new is the recommendation of dapagiplogin and empagiplogin as a class 1 agent in heart failure with mildly reduced or MREP. That is new. And previously, it was a kind of class 2A and also in HEPPEP, it was class 2A. Now it has moved forward with class 1 recommendations. Treatment for etiology, CB and non-CB comorbidities is also class 1 agents. 
diuretics for fluid restrictions or fluid retentions, etc. Uh, uh, fluid restriction is not that emphasized here anymore, but uh, fluid, uh, I mean, treatment of fluid uh, retentions or overloading in, in the initial period re emphasized uh, with uh, diuretic, intravenous diuretics, acetogelomide story, you also know. And uh, if you talk about the negative side of any SGL2, we used to talk about lower lip amputation, ketoacidosis, which is very rare, and uh, stable heart failure, diabetic and non-diabetic, almost negligible here in non-diabetic populations, amputation zero. Some people in diabetic populations, in some, uh, some diabetic population do have some incidence of ketoacidosis, but it is very, very minuscule. Amputation body has gone down. Um, the events avoided or caused for thousand patients with a thousand patients years with the SGL2 is very significant, dramatic, and this is 34 and 23. So this is also a good number. So if you have diabetes or known diabetes, this is not a new thing to know, and this is already known that it can be prescribed even in non-diabetic. Impact of SGL2 inhibitors on very elderly diabetics. There is always a, an apprehension of prescribing RNA in the elderly, SGL2 in the elderly, the MRA in the elderly because of its potential side effect. Uh, for the first time, we have some ideas. This is propensity match scoring. Uh, that means both the group, if you have uh, this kind of figure, like if you have one group, having 5,691, other group is also having 5,691. So this is propensity matching. Is gender, hypertension, cardiac arrest, use of beta blocker, antiarrhythmic drugs, S inhibitor, et cetera, has been matched 70.5 here, 70.5 here. So almost uh, they have equal representations of the characteristics be it a baseline character or be it a medication character. So we have got around 10,000 plus patient. And what we have got, that all-cause mortality, heart failure hospitalizations, incidence of atrial fibrillations, ischemic stroke, TIA, myocardial infarctions, non-fatal, ventricular arrhythmias, cardiac arrest, and surprisingly, RN deficiency anemia. So iron deficiency anemia, you know that uh, RNA also decreases the incidence of anemia in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. ASGL2 is another agent which can preserve your immunoglobin. So all these features tells us that we should not hesitate to prescribe because of these advantages, these beneficial effects. So in this real-world study, SGL2 use was associated with significantly lower risk of adverse outcome, even in elderly populations. Now, right ventricle, most of the time, we do not uh, focus on the right ventricle. But if you have a patient, adult congenital cardiac disease, which has been intervened by surgical means or by stent nowadays, the most of the time before the LV goes into failure, the RV fails. And uh, this is the study to assess SEPTI and evaluate potential conflict of uh, potential clinical benefit of dapagiplogin in patients with uh, a sick right ventricle, a systemic right ventricle. Systemic right ventricle means it is dealing with high pressure zone compared to standard medical treatment for heart failure. Is he is more than 18 years, and uh, since there's a bell ringing, I'll quickly go through. In this small study, that SGL2 in this group of people does help in the improvement of RB functions, and most of these patients are treated with the RNA. So in this uh, small study, uh, from this ongoing single center, DAPA Sarpral tells us that even in a RB heart failure, adult congenital corrected uh, transpositions or other disease, you can prescribe if you have a patient with heart failure with 
uh, sick right ventricle and systemic right ventricle, which is failing. And this is the patient level uh, pooled analysis, America versus Europe versus uh, North and South America and Asia. Apparently, there is increased incidence of your accumulative incidence of primary outcome, cardiovascular death in North America. But statistically, uh, the p-value for interaction is not there. So irrespective of the geographical locations, ethnicity, this Dapagiflogin were consistent across global regions despite geographic differences in patient characteristics, background treatment, and event rates. With that, I like to conclude here and thank you very much. And sincere regards to my teachers, Dr. Mohan, my friends, and Dr. Maharan Sir. Thank you, Prakash, uh, Anna, uh, giving us an input on, on those uh, very interesting areas of elderly patient, which has been uh, one of the therapeutic nihilism areas. I mean, uh, all the three speakers have done a wonderful job. We have, uh, before I go to the chat box and get the uh, questions, uh, I have a few comments and uh, each of, each one of you possibly can. Uh, and now this is Kula Manch. Anybody can, um, possibly everybody can contribute. Uh, Kamal, you said about that, you know, the risk stratification. I mean, the ESC has used more of a you know, the score data, which we are not very familiar with. But when the, possibly the best scoring system for a CBD in, in the Indian setting may be the, the Q-Risk 3 score. And again, we have uh, 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 data, the Indian data also suggesting that the, the uh, even at the time of initial diagnosis, 60% of them are in the either in the high risk or the very high risk. So that's what's interesting. You talked about the LDL levels. If you remember, you now the we have our own Indian group, LAI guideline, which who suggests rather than 55, we should go for 30. So I mean, now uh, we are definitely going to the lower and better concept. The third important uh, point that you have raised is the, the usefulness of SGLT2 in acute MI. That's again one of those very, very, very uh, important because we know the residual risk even now despite all the advances in the treatment. Uh, the ME trial was in fact, it was a small trial less than 500 patients. So um, possibly, and they showed uh, a reduction in the biomarkers. But we just are anxiously waiting for the impact MI and the DAPA MI, which will possibly tell us about, is there any specific role for and at what time we are supposed to begin it. So we are all very much anxious to know about that. Um, your comments and uh, uh, let uh, Mohanji and Prakash also have his, their comments. Yeah, I think uh, you've already summarized a lot of uh, important aspects and raised important points about each of the things that you're mentioning. Yeah, score score is one score which we are not very great at scoring. So that's one problem uh, of area that we need to be get more acquainted and familiar with. Again, a lot of underrepresentation of the Asian Indians in that subgroup of assessment. And as you mentioned very clearly, I think uh, if ethnicity, including the country-wise ethnicity, is to be counted, to be represented, or to be included, then it's QRIS-3, as you mentioned. But again, QRIS-3 would give you overall risk. It would not tell you in a subgroup of diabetic subgroup of patients of risk. But I think QRIS does hold a potential because of a larger database to look at specific subgroup of diabetics and come out with its own score. And I won't be surprised that uh, in one of the next uh, European society meetings, you get okay. a Q-risk modification or subgroup of a diabetic subgroup scoring. Uh, score score otherwise was a, a good methodology in the Caucasian subgroups and had some amount of representation for ASCVD, for the uh, Asian Indians or ethnicity people residing in that part of the world. But as I said, Pakistani versus Bangladeshi versus Indian discrimination exists only in QRIS-3, not in score score. So, uh, and then of course, our own guidelines and 30, as you mentioned, lie guidelines talking about, I think lower is better. But then I think uh, it's not just endorsement of the same, but it is also about reinforcing uh, by one lower pedestal. Actually, you have gone uh, much higher now in terms of where you are entering, even in patients with high risk, but not uh, 
post MI or post CABG alone. In diabetic subgroup, if you are a very high risk, even then you qualify for a cutoff of 55. That's the message that I will take. And I'll take it on the positive side. It's moving in the direction that diabetes, as we all know, beyond a decade is equivalent to one CV risk from the papers that we've read. So that way it endorses that you need not always have a disease manifested the way we define ASCVD. And diabetes itself may be considered uh, in ASCVD uh, in itself. That's what probably it does. Us. That's my comment. Thank you. Mohanji, do you have any concerns? Of, we have seen the use of AR, I mean, uh, ARNI versus uh, ra, the conventional RAS blocker in a acute MI. Do you have any concerns of using SELT2 in acute MI situation? No, I don't have any. But, you know, I, as you rightly said, I would wait for the data from MI and DAPA MI. ME study actually. The as far as reduction in anti pro BNP is concerned, remember we also had similar kind of information for reminder study where aplerinone was used in patients with anterior wall mark infarction. But based upon that trial, you still don't use aplerinone in patients with the post MI patient. You need to have hard outcome data. Uh, the with regard to the paradise MI actually. Although I would say that Arni was doing numerically better, and now that it is um, generic, if you want to use it, and even if it is not there in guidelines, a class one indication, I have no calls with that. But with regard to SGL2 inhibitors, I would like to wait for the data. Prakash, any comments? Yeah, I, I concur with Dr. Mohan's. Uh... But intuitively speaking, you know, I have been using ACL2 for so many years in spite of not having any. So you can extrapolate your thought process from uh, regular patients. So it's, what is MI? MI is just maybe an early heart failure. If you have uh, LED territory gone, you can never ever have, whatever you do, can never ever have a normal myocardium in their life. So practically speaking, your rejection fraction is lower a little bit. So intuitively, again, there is not much data, Dr. Mohan has categorically mentioned. There is no harm on, uh, of using SGL2 in diabetic patients. Definitely, yes, 100%. In non-diabetic patients, if somebody is having a manifested heart failure, I not hesitate in immediate post my patient, not in shock patient, not in septic patient, not in patient who are just coming out for ventilation and all that support. But if you have some amount of LV dysfunction, even in non-diabetic, post-MI, early, I do not hesitate. Again, it is my it is my, my way of thinking, but it is not supported by large randomized clinical trial. Thank you. I mean, what possibly disturbed me was the post-shock analysis of ME, which showed a reduction in the BNP, the, the heart failure biomarker, but no reduction in the inflammatory mark. But then let us wait for that. President Mohan, I'm coming back to you. Uh, now you talk, touched on two important issues, the salt and the exercise, which are absolutely important. And we have a lot of confusion on that. Uh, people say that it's a linear relationship. Now we know it's a U-shaped relationship. So what do you choose? You wanted, you prefer a U-shaped uh, relation? That's number one. Number two, exercise. Exercise, again, the vigorous exercise is something which we all of us advocate. There were some concerns on um, increasing calcification and something, uh, something like incidents of atrial fibrillation or myocardial fibrosis with excessive or vigorous exercise. Are you concerned with those? So let, let me first actually take the issue of salt. This, uh, the U-shaped relationship with regard to oral salt intake, which means if the oral salt intake is less than three gram per day or more than six gram per day, both are associated with ascending curves of mortality. And this has been largely based upon measuring the urinary sodium chloride and extrapolating it to dietary sodium intake. There is no doubt that low sodium intake is associated with activation of renin angiotensin aldosterone system. It is also associated with the sympathetic nervous system active, over activity 
and both could contribute to increased mortality. So there is some justification in U-shaped curve being talked about in patients as far as salt and uh, salt restriction concern. So when you say less than five gram or less than four gram need to qualify that we are talking about, maybe we are talking about anything between three to six grams. We're not really saying that less than four gram doesn't mean that you start taking two gram of sodium chloride. So I, I think we have a good amount of observational data on that. With regard to exercise, I actually looked at this pure study very carefully, 11 years of follow-up. It did not show any adverse effects, although the tapering effect was seen. There were some actually, uh, the, the, uh, the vigorous activity at some level did show that maybe when it is at extreme level, there may be a little bit high chance of uh, increased mortality in cardiovascular risk. But by and large, by no stretch of imagination, you can call it a U-shaped curve. The, uh, the, the, the equal size study, actually, the equal size study was published last month, actually, in, in J Jack and, of course, UK Biobank studies also with a very long follow-up of 10 years. Both are clearly uh, showing that uh, there is probably no U-shaped curve. With There may be actually exceptional patients with very vigorous act activity. Somebody is working four hours a day in gym every day, seven days a week, and gets into trouble. But that's not the routine kind of patient. So by and large, I would say that it is more like a, a monodirectional curve with the with reduction happening at this up to some, some level and then tapering off. So with regard to that moderate physical activity or vigorous physical activity, you still have to have a limit beyond which the benefits or dividends are not there, but you are wasting your time and energy. Yeah, exercise has a great therapeutic potential. The long-term health benefits are phenomenal. Only yeah. possible thing that you are also stressing is listen to your body and then suit your exercise. Now, coming to Prakash, Anna, uh, Prakash, Anna, uh, you've been talking about the uh, AGLT2 in elderly. Actually, elderly was the subset which most of the heart failure trial has uh, avoided. Even though I am not saying that DAPA HF had about 24% uh, you know, of the patients were more than 74, 75 years. But then generally, we were a little scared to give SGLT2 in elderly, especially the frail elderly. But then you have to get, even as yeah. sure that you know, we don't need to worry about at all. That is number one point. Number two point, you know, even the conventional data has shown uh, improvement in the right ventricular function. You have given one particular data where the you know, a, a rare group. Of, but what do you think? Generally, the right ventricular function improves like the left ventricle, or do you think there is some difference in that? I think we have previous data on uh, pulmonary artery hypertension uh, on ACLD2. Now it has been translated into uh, further down in the, into the RV cardiomyopathy or RV dilatations, uh, the RV dynamics, RV volume changes, uh, the strain, etc. Though it's a small trial, but it's a good beginning. And these are the sick people. Most of the time, these people, they go into heart transplant if their right heart failure starts before the left heart. Okay. And uh, so it can, be, it can be given in this group of people. About the elderly people, you know, these people need uh, definitely more frequent visit to our clinic Hello. Uh, because they are sensitive people. They do develop yeah. some kind of comorbidities, infections, fall, trauma, yeah. stroke. I am in a webinar. I'm getting out in five so minutes. I, you should be more vigilant in elderly people, but it yeah. can yeah. be given in elderly people. You have one question from uh, Animesh Sahu. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he says GLP-1 and uh, we have yeah. leader trial. He'll yeah, be leader, just uh, yeah. give to him. Yeah, leader trial has already been uh, discussed in the past. And uh, it has shown that atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, it is basically beneficial in cardiovascular death and mortality reduction. There is no doubt that there are evidence, but not purely in heart failure. I mean, Kamal and uh, Professor Mohan, and, uh, there was a question about uh, SGLT2 using non-diabetic patient for cardiac benefit. 
Yeah, of course. Uh, diabetes. I mean, my concept is that it doesn't matter. It, it previously has thought that get an A1C, how you do it doesn't matter. Now it does matter how you do it, do that. We already know that in terms of uh, patients in declared timi. We know that from uh, patients who in declared timi subgroup where the patient did not have ASCVD. Even in canvas, when you look, there is no question that the patients with need for heart failure hospitalization does reduce. So I, I think even for primary prevention, SGLT2 is a good choice, especially if the patient has a risk profile which categorizes into a high risk subgroup. So again, that's the same thing like score score. When you look at the score score between uh, as I said, between 10 to 20, you would still be very keen to use SGLT2. If you look at the spectrum that I showed in my slides, only in very, very low risk, where you don't have any comp compelling indication, only thing that you else otherwise can use is metformin because that's from the UK PDS days now, 50 years of data. That's all. Otherwise, there is no reason for you not to choose any other drug. I mean, not to choose SGLT2 and choose maybe sulfonylurea or a DPP4. Professor Mohan, I mean, uh, Dr. Sunil Gupta from Delhi was asking, a patient having predominant obesity and borderline HPA1C, should I put him on SGLT2 as a case You pre-diabetes with obesity? I don't want to jump the gun with regard to SGLT2 inhibitors. Maybe I will be doing it for uh, next five, maybe in five years down the line, I will be doing. At the moment, I worship the God of evidence Show me the evidence. I am willing to accept that logic. And in case, at the moment, I don't have an iota of evidence that an obese person with pre-diabetic status will benefit from SGL2 inhibitor. It is likely, but it can be wrong as well, equally wrong as well. On the other hand, GLP-1 analogs, certainly. There, uh, we, we saw a significant data of a step uh, HFPF trial in this ESC, but we also have actually an enormous amount of data from Surmount 2, Surmount 3 study, and many other studies which have clearly shown that weight reduction and uh, metabolic profile gets better with the GLP-1 uh, analogs given in a dose which is a little supra-therapeutic, especially semi-glutide 2.5 milligrams subcutaneous uh, once a week, we saw data. And we have, of course, a um, good amount of data coming out with the uh, double incretin and triple incretin as well. So maybe there I might I might be tempted, and 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 but not not in, not with SGL2 inhibitors. Absolutely, uh, uh, Prakash uh, Anna, what is your opinion of uh, SGLT2 use in acute heart failure? We have ample data on chronic heart failure. We have in acute failure too. Uh, Prakash, can you just uh, uh, answer back our, our Priyanka, uh, that particular answer to that question? Are you around? Or Kamal can take that up? So can you can you uh, uh, tell me the question? More data of HLT in, in uh, uh, chronic heart failure. What about acute heart failure? Now we have the pioneer. Impulse. We have data from Impulse and we have data probably... Uh, also in some subgroup of deliver. Uh, so I think the data is already coming in. I think you can use it at the time of discharge. Uh, also, I can add that it has been started, dapagliflozin has been started in acute COVID pneumonias in DARE 19. It did not worsen the outcomes. It was neutral. There was a trend. It did not be significant. So just to tell you that how safe it is, even in ICU, at least was surely established if, if a bad COVID pneumonia could tolerate dapagliflozin without worsening of outcome even though it did not improve, though the trial was to look at the improvement in uh, COVID out pneumonia outcomes. So that way also uh, ICU suitability or safety is established uh, in hospitalization and acute failure. We already have data. So I'm sure that I, I uh, and a lot of, uh, of our panelists would be agreeing that we do tend to start it at the time of discharge in an acute heart failure for sure. And also, we also know the additional benefits of SGLT2, apart from the conventional loop diuretics, you know, it relieves the tissue uh, edema much faster, yeah. much better. And so definitely, you can cautiously uh, begin mm -hmm. your uh, SGLT2 in the acute heart failure setting. Uh, uh, one last, maybe last question to Professor Mohan. Are there any specific monitoring or assessment recommendation when using SGLT2 inhibitors in patients with peripheral arterial disease? 
peripheral arterial disease, I think the, the issue has been raised because we did have in canvas some evidence of, uh, but then, you know, we, we had those, uh, we had those observational studies, the including the the 4D study, and and of course a large amount of observational data showing that this signal of increased amputation probably was uh, misplaced. It was just a chance phenomenon, chance finding. I don't think in peripheral vascular disease I am at all bothered about any worsening, or I would be doing any any. Um, ankle brachial index or any kind of ultrasound in this patient on a regular basis. I think that was just a pure chance. And even in randomized studies, you can remove confounders, but you can't eliminate confounders. So this is one of the confounders. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we started 15 minutes late. We are uh, dot on time. Uh, Smriti and I possibly has exhausted there are some couple of questions which possibly is not very much rele relevant to the talk. Uh, and uh, uh, I should thank all my three speakers for the excellent way which they have covered the topics. And thanks to all the listeners for their uh, uh, their inputs. And over to you, Sprite. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, with that, we have come to the end of the session. And I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to Dr. P.P. Mohanan, sir for moderating the session so, so amazingly. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you so much to Dr. Kamal Sharma, sir, Dr. J.C. Mohan, sir, and Dr. P.K. Hasra, sir, for taking us through the key highlights of ESC 2023 and for sharing their valuable insights in a crisp way with everyone who, are, who is present here. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, thank you to all the delegates who have been present for this webinar today. And lastly, I would thank my organizing committee team members and digital team who made sure for the smooth execution of this virtual gathering. Thank you, everyone. And uh, with that, good night to everyone.